Now, as most of you know, we are engaged in a series of studies on Sunday evenings under this general title, Truths to Live By. We are in a section of that series on the theme of becoming a Christian, and the title of our study tonight, number 16, is A New Lifestyle. We were reminded at the very beginning of our service tonight that becoming a Christian is the most radical thing that anyone can ever do, the most radical experience in this life that anyone can ever have. Because as our Lord Jesus Christ makes rather clear in this passage in Matthew 16, to become a Christian means to become a follower of a crucified Lord and Master. Here we are 2,000 years after the life, the teaching, and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is, I think, actually no easier for Christians today than it has ever been really to take in that what we do, the step we take when we become Christians, is to follow a master who was first crucified and then resurrected. And that as our Lord Jesus seeks to teach us here, and as the rest of the New Testament underlines for us, the whole of the Christian life is therefore radically counter-culture. It is radically different from anything that this world can possibly offer to us. Because what the Christian gospel offers to us is a summons to follow a crucified and risen master. I say no easier for us to understand this than for earlier Christians. I think I could safely add no easier for us to understand this than for the very first Christians. As this passage in Matthew's Gospel and its parallels in Mark's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel makes abundantly clear. As John Rushton said earlier on in the service, this passage, this moment, when Simon Peter confesses the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah and Lord and God, And then Jesus begins to teach them about the significance of his future life. This really is the hinge on which the gospel turns. And Jesus himself underlines this, as you would see here in the passage, by saying it was from that time, apparently not before that time, but from that time, that he began to teach them, as he does in Matthew's Gospel, again and again and again. That the pathway from this point for Jesus is the pathway to Jerusalem and the pathway to crucifixion. And so this point is the turning point in the Gospel. It is the turning point in Jesus' ministry. And it is the turning point in the life also, obviously, of Simon Peter. The story begins in verses 13 to 16 of Matthew 16 with Simon Peter's confession. In the midst of all the opinions that there are going the rounds about Jesus, Simon Peter, when push comes to shove, and it rather clearly did come to shove here, Simon Peter in a corner bursts out, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's on that basis that Jesus then begins to teach them something that they didn't know before. You are Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. In response to Simon's confession of Christ's lordship, The Lord Jesus gives him a little glimpse of what he is going to do in the future. He is going to build 
a congregation of his people, a new community that worships and praises him and lives for his glory. But then you notice in verses 21 and 22 that our Lord Jesus Christ begins to explain how this is going to be accomplished. This is not going to be accomplished by him becoming the typical Jewish Messiah, delivering the people from their bondage to Rome. This is going to come through what Paul calls the foolishness and the weakness of the cross. This is going to come by Jesus being seized and then being crucified and then, wonder of wonders, rising again on the third day. And as Jesus begins to explain what it will mean for him to be the Lord and Messiah that Simon Peter has confessed, Simon Peter immediately takes him aside. And you notice the language there? Simon Peter took him aside. That is to say, Simon Peter actually physically took hold of Jesus, drew him aside, eyeballed him, and said, Never! I do not permit you to go this way. Never. And Simon Peter's great confession in verse 16 now verges on Simon Peter's great retraction. Almost as though he is saying to Jesus, I wish I'd never said what I said so that I would never hear what I think I've just heard. You will never go to the cross. You must never, never be this kind of Messiah. And so our Lord Jesus, having rebuked Simon Peter, then, you notice, turns to all of the disciples in verse 24 and begins to explain not simply to Simon Peter, but to all of the disciples... Not only is he going to go to the cross, but if they are going to be his disciples, there is a profound sense in which they also will need to go to the cross. And he is really explaining to all the disciples that what underlies Simon Peter's retraction at this point is, first of all, a failure to understand How radical is the new life to which he is called? And then supremely a reluctance to live that radical new life. At the end of the day, it is very clear the reason Peter doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross is because he sees the implications of that not simply for Jesus, but also for himself. And the Lord Jesus is saying to Simon Peter here, Simon Peter and my beloved disciples, you need to grasp this absolutely fundamental thing. There is no other way. There is no other way either for me to become the Savior of men and women, nor is there another way for you truly to be my disciples than that you should deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And so it's in these verses 24 to 28 that Jesus, who himself has embarked on the journey towards the cross, is explaining to his disciples what it means to follow him, to be learners from him, which is, of course, what disciple means to have Him as our Savior, our Lord, our Master, and our Guide. And about this new lifestyle, as I've called it, the Lord Jesus has four things of great importance to say to you and to me. First of all, in verse 24, He teaches us about its foundation. Follow me, he says. Deny yourself. 
take up your cross and follow me. Interestingly, although he had not himself spoken about his own crucifixion, his own desperate death until this point, he had already, a couple of chapters before, actually in chapter 10, given them indications that being disciples of his meant this kind of lifestyle. He had already sown the seed, given them a little hint about the direction their lives would take if they were going to follow him. He recognized earlier on in the Gospels they simply wouldn't have been able to take it in if he had said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. But he didn't want to mislead them into thinking that discipleship meant something less than it really did. And so he'd already explained to them the radical nature of being his disciple. But here now he connects these two things together. He connects the foundation on which discipleship is built with the foundational principle by which discipleship is learned. The foundational principle on which discipleship is built is, of course, Jesus' own crucifixion. There is no doubt now in their minds what Jesus meant earlier on when he said, if you're going to follow me, you need to take up the cross. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be taken there. And at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, I'm going to be killed. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross too. There was no doubt now that he was speaking not simply about his rejection, but about the nature of that rejection, that it would involve him being crucified outside of the city as a criminal, that his death would be the penalty for crime, that when he died on the cross, he wasn't going to die as a result of natural consequences nor simply at the hands of man's cruelty. But the kind of death he was going to die was very specifically the death that a criminal would die. And of course, he was giving them a hint of what would then become clearer later on in the gospel story and finally clear in the light of his resurrection and the teaching about its meaning that he gave to them that his crucifixion, his death, his death was going to be a penal death. That is to say, he was going to die in order to pay the penalty for their sins. As one of the older hymns puts it, upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I stake my whole eternity. And this, for the whole of the Bible, from start to finish, is the absolute foundation stone of the Christian gospel and of Christian discipleship. We cannot begin to live the Christian life unless this foundation stone is in place that we understand why Jesus came into the world why Jesus went to Jerusalem, and why Jesus died the way he did. It was in order to bear the penalty, the just judgment of God upon our sins. And then as the evidence that his death had been accepted as a sacrifice for our sins, as evidence of that, God raised him up from the dead and gave him power and majesty and a name that is above every other name. And it's precisely because that is the kind of Savior Jesus is, the kind of Lord and Master He is, because His life is cross-shaped, that all those who embrace Jesus Christ, trusting Him as Savior, Master, and Lord find themselves being drawn in to share in His cross. 
And so Jesus says to them, if you want to come after me, if you want me to be your master and to follow in my footsteps, then there is a shadow that is going to fall upon your life. And that shadow is the shadow of the cross. And if you're going to bear that cross, he says, it is essential for you that you deny yourself and take it up and follow me. In other words, to become a Christian, to become a Christian is to have a death sentence pronounced on every self-centered drive for your future life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian who died at the hands of the Nazis just towards the end of the Second World War in one of his most famous books on the Sermon on the Mount called The Cost of Discipleship puts it rather vividly like this. He says, when Jesus Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When the Holy Spirit takes hold of your life and draws you to Jesus Christ and your life embraces Jesus Christ as Savior, Master, and Lord, then in a sense Jesus is saying in that action you are signing willingly a death warrant on your life in which you die to self and live forevermore to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has different ways of putting this, and he reflects on it a great deal because it was such a big deal for him. He says, for example, in Galatians 6, 15, speaking about the cross, he says, gladly will I boast or glory or exult in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which the world is crucified to me and I am crucified to the world. The moment Paul took up the cross to follow Jesus was a moment in which actually, in his case, quite literally, he signed his death warrant. Or in a different way, in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Christ died for us all, that those who live should no longer live unto self but to Him. So the foundation of this new lifestyle is rooted in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross, which when you embrace begins to make its own impact upon your life. Or if I can put it like this, when you embrace Jesus Christ in all the blood of His crucifixion, It isn't possible to step away into future life without yourself being marked by the blood of Jesus. And that's the foundation in verse 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, from one point of view, that could seem very grim. And from one point of view, it is very grim. Because the battle for my soul is a grim battle that God is fighting. And the work of transforming little me into something precious for God is a mighty business. But it's not all grim. And Jesus goes on from giving us the foundation of this new lifestyle to verse 25, providing us with an explanation for its principles. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever, says Jesus, loses his life for me will find it. Now you see that this explanation of what he said is a great encouragement to us. We hear this language about dying, about bearing the cross, and we instinctively shrink back. Simon Peter was instinctively shrinking back. You could almost sense the disciples round about eyeing each other. 
and saying to themselves, well, I'm glad I didn't say anything like that to him. Is this what we've let ourselves in for? But Jesus has these words of explanation that are simultaneously words of wonderful encouragement. He says, you know, there is a deep spiritual law at work. There is a deep spiritual law at work. And if you grasp it, you will see why my summons to you is so radical. And the deep spiritual law is this, that as you try to preserve your life, you end up losing it. It's only when you lose your life for my sake that you find it. And this is how it is. This is actually how it is. As you and I keep a grim, tight grip on self and on all that goes with self, what do we discover? We discover that spiritually we shrivel up. But when our hands are opened to anything that Jesus Christ calls us to do, to anything that He is pleased to perform through us, and we say to Him as we sing, have your own way, Lord, have your own way, then the releasing of our lives, the losing of our lives for Jesus' sake, is the first step to a fullness and to a joy and to a glorious liberty that we never could have known before. So long as I hang on tightly to my life and say to Jesus, you can have, you can have all kinds of things, Jesus, but you may not have me. I need to be master of my own destiny. I need to be in control. I daren't, I daren't yield all like that to you. Then the inevitable result is that we lose everything that we sought to preserve. Whereas, says Jesus, those who are willing to lose life, They are the ones who gain it. He's not just speaking here, you understand, about martyrdom. He's not just speaking about what happens to some Christian believers, true though that is. He's he's speaking about a general principle of living the Christian life. Hold on to it, and you can never have it. Let it go to Christ. You remember how he put it? He said, it's those who seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, who not only find that kingdom, but have everything else added to it. That's the kind of death that the Christian believer is to die daily as he follows Jesus Christ. That idea was, I think, very magnetically expressed in the writings of the late 19th, very early 20th century Scottish author and at one time minister, George MacDonald, the man who more than anyone else, I think, had such a huge influence on C.S. Lewis. Lewis said he thought he'd never written a book without quoting George MacDonald. Now, George MacDonald, in my estimation, was no accurate theologian, but he was an extraordinarily vivid writer of fantasies. And there's an idea that recurs in his greatest fantasies that he calls the good death. And he has different ways of describing men and women faced with the reality of losing everything in death and grimly holding on to everything until some wise counselor will say to them, it is only by yielding it all up in death that you will ever discover life. It's an idea undoubtedly that George MacDonald gleaned from the pages of the New Testament and particularly from what Jesus is saying here. There is a death to be died in following Jesus Christ that from one point of view is the most terrifying thing in the world because it means 
that all that you are and all your domination of your life is yielded up to the Lord Jesus. And that, from one point of view, is a terrifying thought that you are no longer in control of your own destiny. But the glory of it lies in this, that you have now placed your destiny in the hands, the safest hands in the universe. The only hands in the universe where your life is really safe are not your own hands, but the hands of Jesus Christ. We sometimes sing about that in George Matheson's sweet hymn, O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. In one of George MacDonald's books, there's a character who is challenged in this particular way, and he finds himself faced with an individual called the old man of the earth who is opening up, as it were, opening up in this cave, a hole that leads into the good death. And the character says to the old man of the earth, when the old man says, that's the way, the character says, but there are no stairs. And the old man of the earth says, there are no stairs. You must throw yourself in. There is no other way. And that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, throw yourself into my arms. There is no other way to be safe. There's no other way to find life than to lose your life in my arms and to be protected by my grace. So, there's a foundation to discipleship. There's an explanation of this secret character of discipleship. And then in verse 26, Jesus gives us a wonderful motivation for following in this way of discipleship. What good, he says, will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet in the process of gaining the whole world forfeits or loses his own soul. Or what can a man give, says Jesus, in exchange for his soul? And you see now what he's saying, as he encourages us to yield absolutely to him. He's saying, think it through. Think it through. Do the calculations, but do the calculations properly. Do the sums. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world? Lose your own soul. It's interesting in the New Testament that that principle is said to have been used by at least two different people thousands of years apart. Hebrews 11 tells us how Moses used that principle, although he only had this promise that the Savior would come. Moses had a choice. On the one hand, there were the treasures of Egypt. On the other hand, there was the suffering of persecution with the people of God, and he was faced with the challenge. Are you going to hold on to your life, or are you going to release your life? Are you going to secure yourself and provide security by gaining the whole world? And as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was pretty near to being able to gain the whole world. What security that would bring you. Do you remember how Hebrews 11 puts it? That Moses counted it greater riches to suffer persecution with the people of God than to of all the treasures of Egypt. And he was right. And interestingly, exactly the same language, the same verbs used by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 when he looks back upon his life and everything that he had amassed. 
all these religious qualifications that he had amassed in order to give him a kind of spiritual security and all the accomplishments he had, he said, I counted them as loss for the sake of the surpassing excellency of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord as he yielded up these treasures that instinctively he would have held on to, he discovered that there was an infinitely greater value in knowing Jesus Christ. God is no man's debtor, no woman's debtor, no young person's debtor. This is a cast iron promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. Lose your life for my sake, and you will find it. Preserve your life for your own sake, and you will, at the end of the day, lose it. Almost exactly 30 years ago, I can hardly believe it, when I came to this church as Mr. Duncan's assistant, we used to have services on uh, weekday mornings for 15 minutes. They were called Worship Before Work was dreadful getting into town for worship before work. And I could tell you all kinds of exciting and adventurous stories about worship before work. But I've never forgotten, here I was in the church, a a boy really, as I look back now, I think a boy. How did Mr. Duncan ever put up with me? And at the end of worship before work, one midweek, a man in his late thirties, I would guess, came to speak to me and said, can I have a word with you? We spoke together. And here was a man who had, by dint of his own activity and diligence, amassed what to me was the most amazing fortune, provided in lavish ways for his wife. And now he did the news that His wife had an inoperable cancer. And his whole world had tumbled, understandably, round about him. But the thing that struck me most of all was that he had no treasure left anywhere. Anywhere. It was all stored up in the bank, in the house, in the drawers, in the cars, in the clothes, in the holidays. And from my little point of view, he seemed to have gained the whole world. He had everything at his feet. And now it was crumbling in his hands like so much sand. And you see, the thing is, in the last analysis, that's true for everybody. It may not happen as dramatically as it did in that man's life. But in the last analysis, that happens to everybody, doesn't it? No matter how much you have stored up at the end of the day, Jesus is saying you can grip it as tightly as you want and say, I am secure. But at the end of the day, the breath leaves you. The light of life goes out. The energy of existence fails. And the hands can no longer hold on. And Jesus is saying, if you would only think clearly, if you'd only think accurately about your treasure, then you would see what a mighty motivation there is and why I am so urgent in calling you to lose your life for my sake in order that you may find it and not grip on to the treasures of this world when you could be gripping on to the treasures of eternity. You remember how Newton put it? He knew a thing or two about this. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. And so in verse 27, Jesus concludes with a word of admonition. Foundation, explanation, motivation, 
and now admonition. Oh, he says, and then look at all this in the light of the great day of eternity. For the Son of Man, he says, is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Now, Jesus is not saying there, at the end of the day, Jesus is going to tot up your accomplishments here and there, put them in the balances and say, well, he's done better than him. We'll give him this and we'll give him that. It's clear from the other Gospels that what Jesus is saying, as you remember perhaps in the other Gospels, how he speaks about that day when those who have been ashamed of him, of them he will be ashamed. But of those who have been unashamed of Christ, who have counted Christ the greatest treasure of all, of them Jesus will be utterly unashamed, welcoming them into his kingdom. We could fill out this sentence by saying, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done with him with him. My friends, we ought not to think that if we've been ashamed of Jesus in this life, there is going to be anything that will happen to us because we have died that will make us unashamed of him then. But if we have been unashamed of Jesus in this life, no matter how much shame has accompanied that, then he says on that day, I will be unashamed of you. And what a pointed application that must have had for Simon Peter, who here on this occasion, he was just ashamed of what Jesus was saying. He was saying, Jesus, I don't want you to be like that, and I certainly don't want to follow a Savior like that. And he struggled with that through the rest of Jesus' ministry until in the most literal sense he really was ashamed of Jesus. So that this bruised reed of a servant girl could simply topple him over just by a little press of her finger. He was so holding on, holding on to himself, not letting go, finding his security in himself rather than finding it in Jesus Christ, that she just toppled him over. Until by God's grace, he was most wonderfully restored. I wouldn't be surprised, but that's where some of us are, perhaps many of us. Do you think Glasgow would be in the condition that it's in tonight if Christian people had been absolutely unashamed of Jesus? You and I know many instances in our lives when we have chosen the treasure of this world rather than the treasure of Jesus. In very simple things, we have preferred the treasure of getting on well with people to the treasure of being faithful to the Lord Jesus. And we know spiritually, isn't this true? Would there be anybody in this building tonight who would say, I am the richer spiritually because I've been ashamed of Jesus? Now, we all know, like Simon Peter, that when we are ashamed of Jesus, we are diminished as men and women and diminished as Christians, and we slink away into the darkness of the Jerusalem night. But oh, when we are unashamed of the Lord Jesus, He is unashamed of us, and we know it here and now as well as there and then. Because having been prepared to lose with Christ, Because he is now risen from the grave triumphant, we cannot but gain with Christ. Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of the famous Jim Elliot, who was martyred many years ago now by the Auka Indians, writes in one of her books, young people sometimes say to me, 
I'll just die if the Lord calls me to be a missionary. And she says, I always say the same thing. Wonderful. That's exactly the place to begin. Would you die if the Lord called you to be a missionary? But He is calling you to be a missionary. Tomorrow, He's calling you to be a missionary. And the only way to become a missionary, the only way to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is to taste that good and sweet death with Jesus Christ that leads to the glory, to the blessing of this radical new life and this radical new lifestyle which Elizabeth Elliot's husband once well described in these words. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The Christian gospel has the cross of Christ and a crucified and risen Savior at its heart, but that cross has two sides. There is the side on which Jesus died, and there is the side of that cross that he now lays upon my shoulders and says to me, if you will be my disciple, then you too must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And some of his blood will always seep through to the other side. Dear friends, to taste that death is to taste the good death. And it's true. There are no stairs. The only thing you can do is throw yourself in and discover that he's there. And he's everything you'll ever need. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what the new lifestyle is all about. Come now. Whatever your reservations, however inwardly you tremble at the way in which God's Spirit applies this teaching to your particular life, in whatever sphere of life, whatever aspect of your whole existence, the Lord Jesus is putting his finger on an exposed nerve and saying to you now, this has got to die. And you've got to die to this. But die to this and live to me. You will find treasures you've never experienced before. Let's take up our cross and die and discover as we throw ourselves into this good death that it is actually the gateway to glorious everlasting life. And that's his promise. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your teaching to us Thank you for the way in which you take us by your Holy Spirit and through your Word. And as though we were in a little schoolroom and the only pupil present, you, Lord Jesus, teach us the way of the cross. Lord, we pray for grace to respond we inwardly tremble at the cost. We inwardly tremble at the knowledge that this is a daily dying. But we pray that you would hold before us this marvelous prospect of a daily living, of life in all its fullness, lived freely for Jesus Christ, 
of a lifestyle that isn't any longer dominated by our contemporary culture, but is free and glorious and new and fresh and real. We pray that this may be ours and that we may be given grace to see and to feel both the grimness of it all because we are such sinners and the glory of it all because you are such a gracious Savior and Master. We pray you would show us you have never, ever, ever done any of your disciples any harm, but only good. Encourage us, we pray, in the different places where we live and study and work and take our leisure to live this new life for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.